What I want to talk about today, uh, as, as Michael said, is it's, it's the ideal software job. And what's interesting, there have actually been studies about what is an ideal job. I mean, what, what do people consider a successful project? And an interesting study, actually it's a PhD study, uh, and what, what uh, they found was that the engineers' views and the manager's views are different. And so I want to start with that. Uh, and, and you've heard about uh, death march projects. Ed Jordan has got a book he wrote on the subject. And uh, they're the typical projects that are just absolute disasters. People work in all hours, and, and, and it's amazing how many projects, big projects, actually get canceled and they're never even finished. Uh, and this is a question of the size, the scope of the systems. The bigger systems are practically no large-scale systems that are truly successful. Uh, and, and the question is, is what's, a, what's a really good project like? And, and for people who've worked in industry and, and actually worked on delivering products, and I, I've done that for many, many years, they're, they're projects you remember. They were just absolutely great to work on. And, and the issue is, what are the characteristics of those projects? And the question, of course, is why couldn't every job be, be like that? And, and that's really what, the, what I want to talk about here. So I want to talk a little bit about some typical projects. I want to talk about what I call critical success factors. What does it take to really have a successful project? And, and it involves, not surprisingly, people and how you manage people. And there's quite a history, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. And then it comes to something called knowledge work. If you're familiar with Peter Drucker, he introduced the, the subject of knowledge work. And he sort of described it and characterized it, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then a process for that, and, and what it's like when people actually work the way we're talking. And there is some experience. So first of all, as I say, projects are typically not successful, particularly software-intensive projects. Hardware projects are. I mean, I, I've run, years ago, I ran hardware projects before I got into the software business. And by and large, we were delivering stuff on schedule. And it was working OK. And that was not characteristic of most software jobs. And so one of the questions is, why is it so different? And we can talk about that a little bit as we go ahead. So first of all, uh, when you look at a project that didn't work, and you ask the engineers what happened, you get a whole bunch of, 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 of kind of reactions. They weren't achievable from the beginning, too much pressure, all kinds of overtime. They were frustrating technically, lots of conflicts, all kinds of stuff. And so you see that in projects. I'll, I'll typically ask uh, engineering groups, what, what is it that was the real problem with your project? Why did it fail? And you know what most answers people say? Any, any, any guess as to what the typical reason is that people give for a software project not being successful? The engineers themselves. Probably something to do with requirements. Yeah. The requirements, all the yeah. The requirements change. Right? They say that, that was the problem. That was why I was in trouble. And I get that, I mean, I ask groups all the time, and that is the number one point. And so I ask them, have you ever worked on a project where the requirements didn't change? And no one ever has. So my point is that when you say the requirements change, and that was the problem, you're saying somebody else did it to me. Right? 
because your process has to be designed to live with changing requirements or you're not working in a real world. The real world is requirements change. And so the process has to be able to deal with that. And when you blame somebody because the requirements change, you're saying it's not my fault. Right? Well, quite frankly, the engineers need to know how to work in the real world, and that's what the real world is. And so that, that's, a, there, as I say, there are all kinds of reasons you can point to, but that's one of the big ones. And of course, the issue of unreasonable schedules at the outset is, is an obvious one. Uh, and I, I like to ask the question on that, by the way. When, when a project starts, generally, the project will start by management giving a date to the team, saying, here's what we want, and we've got to have it in six months. And, and typically, what I find, software teams go off and they treat the six months as an absolute firm deadline. They got to do it in six months. But what's interesting is hardware teams never do that. Never do. They'll take a look at it and say, look, chief, six months, to get it in six months, we got these long lead time items, we got this problem and that problem, and it'll, it'll take nine months to get it done, sorry. And they'll have that debate, and it's based on some facts. Software engineers never do that. So I ask software teams when they give, we, we go do, I work with teams. We launch a project. We'll start with management, and we'll give them a date. And we tell the, the developers, don't react to that date. Let's go back and think about it. So management says six months. I ask the team, what was management saying? When management says six months, what do you think they're saying? Anybody? Opinion? What they're saying is, I want this as fast as I can get it, and the fastest I think you can do it is six months. If you came back and said, okay, chief, we could do it in six months, what was, what's the first thing they'd think about? I should have asked for four, right? <laughs> of course. So it's a bid. So those are some of the issues you deal with. And, and they're real, and they concern all the, the interactions of how projects get started and how they work. So, so let's talk about a successful project. And the general opinion is a successful project is one that meets the user's expectations. It's delivered on time. Uh, it costs what it's supposed to cost. Well, that's the manager's view of success. When you define success for the engineers and they say to you what was really a successful project, you get a different story. It was an exciting technical challenge. It really, the, the thing came out and it worked well and we had a great team. That's a success for the developers, right? And what's interesting is the developers feel that the project was well designed and all of this sort of thing and everybody worked well and they weren't unduly pressured by management. It really it was a kind of a winning situation. The point is the developers feel the key is how the team worked and the technical challenges and, and performance of the group. It is almost independent of cost and schedule performance. It would be nice to do it on schedule. I mean, everybody tries. But that isn't a key. If it wasn't on schedule and it didn't cost what it was supposed to cost and it had an overruns and all that, but it met all the other criteria, the engineers really felt it was successful. And conversely, the management's in view is almost exactly the reverse. The key is cost and schedule performance. It's almost regardless of team chemistry. This is a real conflict in a way. I mean, you've got these two groups that are working. I mean, you're honest to goodness. You've got the engineers that are working for the managers, and the managers are paying them and appraising them and all that sort of thing. And they've got different views of what's success. Ever played on a team where you were playing, you've got some people playing soccer and some others basketball? I mean, you're not going to do very well. You're aiming for different goals. So that's a problem, and it's a fundamental problem, because if you're not together on the goal, the odds are you're not going to get there. Yes? Uh, on this uh, perception of the project being a technical challenge, now, mm -hmm. can you translate that into there was a learning component that the, the engineers felt that they uh, sort of matured technically or learned something? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Matter of fact, it's interesting been quite a few studies about that. Something that was an interesting and exciting challenge 
once isn't so interesting and exciting the second time. So there's a learning component and what, what teams view as exciting and technically rewarding changes. And when you've really done something, you've done it several times and real well, keeping doing the same thing is nowhere near as exciting and, and, and challenging in the future. And so that's all part of the same chemistry. And, and that's one of the challenges, of course, of, of, of this business. When people get really good at something, they want to move on to something else. And, and so those are some of the issues you run into.